Hey everybody, it's stand-up comedian Chris Stefano. Welcome to Christeries. We're going to talk about the atomic bomb, the A-bomb, the nuke, the big one. Everybody thinks that the atomic bomb was a direct response to Pearl Harbor, but guess what? It wasn't. What it was was a response to the ongoing war with Japan and a message to the world that says, don't fuck with the United States. But first, we got to talk about how the hell do we even get into World War II? Okay, so the U.S. during the 1920s and 30s is fun, fun, fun. So let's take it to 20 years before we entered World War II to the 1920s, where the U.S. was going through the Great Depression. Aw, give it some Xanax. Who is our president? FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, good old President Polio. Now, everybody loved President FDR. He was a good president, had the country behind his back, because what he said was, we are not going into Europe's war. We will not enter Europe's war. That's their war. We're the United States. We're not going into their little bullshit. U.S. remained neutral. They remained gender neutral during international unrest through the 1930s. You had Japan occupying Manchuria, a little thing we call the Rape of Nanking, but now they call it the Nanking Massacre. Ooh, somebody what somebody wants to whitewash history. It was Japanese raping the Chinese people, which everyone just forgets about. Italy's invasion of Ethiopia, which was a horrific time um, for Ethiopia because, I mean, who the hell wants to have lamb meat with marinara sauce? I know marinara sauce tastes better on everything, but these people, they don't want fettuccine roti. Nazi Germany, bad news bears, Nazi Germany, even though the most horrific Nazi Germany, best uniforms, but most horrific. And then we had the Spanish Civil War, which threatened U.S. isolationism because the Spanish Civil War going on, you know, very close to the South in Cuba. We're eventually going to invade Cuba years later. And then Franklin Delano Roosevelt's cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, gets involved. The Rough Riders, that's another video. The U.S. was not getting involved with this international unrest. They just didn't want to. FDR said no. FDR, here's the difference between FDR and Joe Biden. FDR said we're not getting involved. Joe Biden is getting involved with the Russia-Ukraine. And the common thing about FDR and Joe Biden is they both wear diapers. So in response to these conflicts, the U.S. Congress passed a series of neutrality acts, which basically prevented the American people from going to war. They had to stay neutral. America said, we are going to be gender neutral to the world, okay? That's what it is. Respect my pronouns. Japan basically felt that it was manifest destiny. They needed to take over Asia. They were going to take over China. They tried to take over the Philippines. They were taking, and they were getting pretty close to U.S. territories because you know the U.S., you know we loved our Filipinos. We love being Filipino. And Japan tried to take over the Philippines and then we'd have no Joe Koi. Imagine a life with no Easter Sunday. That would suck. So here's the thing. Japan always had a bit of a chippy whippy on their shoulder with the U.S. and the Western world because at the end of World War I, where Japan was on our side, the good guy side, they had the Treaty of Versailles in Versailles, France, which I've been to that palace, lovely. They had this treaty, and basically Japan got cut out of it. They were like, everyone else is getting the spoils of war. Everyone else is getting money. Everyone else is getting land. But Japan, they just treated like the ugly stepsister. They were like, get out of here. Even though you fought with us, we're not giving you anything. And it kind of crippled Japan's economy. They didn't get all these things that the other Western countries who won World War I got. So they were always kind of mad. As Japan is a growing empire... In the 1930s, they believe that they're going to take over Asia. They're like, nobody respects us, so we're going to take it. We're going to fight the people who look just like us and act, look, act just like us, and we're going to have our own little civil war, and we're going to start killing all these other Asian people, all these other innocent, innocent Asians, and we're going to start to have our own manifest destiny and take over um, the, and take, try to take over Asia. Now, how the U.S. responds to this is by having full embargo on exports to Japan. Now, that's a big problem because Japan was getting a lot of their oil and a lot of their oil money from the United States. So how is the Japanese war machine going to be able to continue to rape and kill innocent Chinese citizens without U.S. money? You can't. What the U.S. did is they froze Japanese assets in U.S. banks and they sent supplies to China along the Burma Road. So kind of like, just think about the Russia-Ukraine conflict, how we're helping Ukraine. That's what this was. We're helping the Chinese. And we're saying the Japanese is you poopy heads. No, Japanese are little Vladimir Putin heads. You poopy Putins. We don't want that. We're not helping Japan. We're helping China. 
U.S., they believed that without access to money and goods that Japan was going to have to stop. They were going to have to stop fighting this war. They're going to have to stop taking over the people of China, this whole manifest destiny. They were going to stop progressing through Asia and they weren't going to get anywhere near the U.S. strongholds of the Philippines and Guam and all these nations over there. Japan was going to get stopped. They were going to get stopped in its tracks. Japan was going to have to put the chopsticks back in their pocket and go home. But these sanctions made the Japanese even more determined to stand their ground. They said, you know what? We're not, you want to sanction, you want to sanction me? No, sir. No lunch special for you. So basically the feeling in the late 1930s, early 1940s is we do not want another war. We did World War I. We do not want a World War II. We don't, U.S. is saying we are not going to war. But then what happens on September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. Whoops. So that kind of really begins the German blitzkrieg and you see this German war machine that is kicking the shit out of every European country that it goes to. And you know what a big thing is? You know what a big thing is that people don't talk about? Germany, Hitler, and the powers that be of the Nazis, they did not allow anybody in their military to have prostitutes and they didn't, you were not allowed to have sex if you were Nazi Germany. Also, they had Panzer Chocolat, which was crystal meth. So a lot of the Nazis were on crystal meth and all very horny, not being able to get their loads out like the other countries were able to just have prostitutes and have sex and jerk off and whatever. But the Nazis were literally on crystal meth and just with a fully just balls full to the gills. And they went and they started killing everybody because number one, they were pieces of shit. But number two, they're on crystal meth. And number three, they were fucking horned up. So that was just a little aside. May 10th, 1940, Winston Churchill, my favesicles, becomes prime minister of Britain. You know I love his quotes. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. Great quote. Um, Winston Churchill becomes prime minister. Five days later, he actually called his boy FDR to explain that the British military was in serious trouble. I mean, the Nazis were coming at them. The Nazis were beating the shit out of everybody. You have to understand how powerful the German Nazis were in the early 1940s. They were just they were another country that was just furious because they got decimated in World War I. They had no money. They basically, the Hitler came in and gave Germany a new identity and said, we are the new warmongers. We are the world war machine. So their whole, they were war. They were like a, a, a you, know, you know, like when when you learn about the war tribes like the you know the Algonquins or the Iroquois skinning that this was the Nazis they were the war tribe so uh, uh, Winston Churchill was rightfully scared and asked FDR for help and FDR was like listen I can't feel my legs actually I'm gonna read you a quote in July of 1940 FDR actually says to the people because he wants to get an unprecedented third term as El Presidente he says we will not participate in foreign wars and we will not send our army naval or air forces to fight in foreign lands outside of the Americas except in case of attack so FDR won 55 percent of the popular vote and an electoral college victory of 449 to 82 he beat the shit out of his candidate whoa but then what happens? Everybody knows what happens. We're not going to war unless we're attacked. We're not going to war. We're not going to war. Well, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor, which now I'm starting to think, did Winston Churchill have anything to do with this? Was Winston Churchill the one who made the Japanese go attack us? Because Winston Churchill was dying for the U.S. to go into the war. But meanwhile, we, there was nothing that was going to do it unless an unprovoked attack. I wonder if Winston Churchill actually, I wonder, a little conspiracy, I wonder if Winston Churchill talked to the Japanese and gave them some money and said, hey, why don't you go attack Pearl Harbor? And great, I'll give, yeah, you can, um, you can uh, I'll send you pictures of, of the queen's feet and you go attack Pearl Harbor. I, want, I never thought about that until now. Holy shit. I think Winston Churchill made the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Wow. Write in the comments, what do you guys think? It, it is interesting, right? Because you got Pearl Harbor, you got Pearl Harbor happening December 7th, 1941, and a lot of people don't understand why the hell would the Japanese just attack the United States? Well, they attacked them because of this embargo that we mentioned. They, Japanese was bleeding, they had no oil to, for their war machine. So they, 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 they had no choice. They were like, the only way, the only way that we're gonna be able to survive this is if we knock the United States out of the war before they can even get involved. So what they tried to do was basically attack their Pacific fleet. Ja Japan said, we're gonna attack your Pacific fleet, which they thought all the boats were at Pearl Harbor and they were gonna knock out the US Navy before the US Navy could even begin, but they were wrong. They, they got bad info and three of the big 
U.S. naval aircraft carriers were out in the middle of the sea. So they did destroy some boats, but not all of it. And you know the story. The U.S., they regained themselves like a couple of months later, and we came back and we fought, baby. The attack on Pearl Harbor was a surprise military strike by the Imperial Japanese Navy, okay? A little surprise attack, a little sneak attack. It happens. It happens. And they wanted to give us a knockout blow. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. You know what happened to Japan, and we're going to get to that. After the attack... President FDR has to have a session with Congress, and then he has to make a speech on December 8th, and he famously says, he says, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. <laughs> on December 8th, Congress approved Roosevelt's declaration of war. They approved it quick, quick, quick. They approved it quicker than Nancy Pelosi could approve some money going to the Ukraine for her boy Zelensky. So Winston Churchill was low-key happy the USA got bombed, but he was a little nervous because he's like, oh, is FDR just going to want to get revenge on Japan and not help us beat back the Nazis? So there was a little bit of... The thing is what you'll see throughout this video and throughout history is that the big leaders, Churchill, FDR, and Joseph Stalin of Russia, all were friends but enemies. They were frenemies because they all were kind of like, we don't trust each other, but we kind of have to now. It's like very adversarial. So it's interesting, and I'm going to explain what all that means in a minute. It is interesting that the U.S. goes to war, you know, because we're trying to free people and liberate people, but then we put the Japanese in internment camps, which nowadays I would wa I want to put the Japanese in internment fasting camps. Baby, it works. Japanese citizens went to internment camps, and German citizens, German-Americans, all they had to do was check that they didn't have some type of shortwave radio to communicate with the U.S. enemy. So it was a difference. The Japanese went into camps and Germany just had their stuff checked. So, but I think it's probably because Japanese actually attacked the U.S. where Germany didn't, but you'll not say. Tell us in the comments what you think. So you know how we always talk about a race to the moon? That's all over here, race to the moon, race to the moon, us versus the Russians. Well, there was also a race to the atomic bomb. And you'll see, this is one of the first and only times in history where white people beat Asians at math. So in 1939, a year before we're gonna enter the war, FDR is informed by US intelligence operatives that, yo, Adolf Hitler is working on a nuke. Adolf is working on a nuke and he's got these German scientists that are getting close. So in 1939, three German physicists had actually discovered nuclear fission, which is what enables the massive amount of energy to cause the nuke. So then these two Hungarian scientists realized what was happening and they told FDR. So this is one situation in history where it's okay to rat. So the Manhattan Project, we know what the Manhattan Project is. This is what makes the nuclear bomb. Why was it called the Manhattan Project, even though most of the research was done in New Mexico? It's because the official name, the National Defense Research Committee, was formed in New York City's borough of Manhattan. And here's another little fun fact about the Manhattan Project. The scientists who helped create it were actually refugees from fascist regimes in Europe. And there's actually video of American citizens standing outside the Manhattan Project while the refugees are making this nuke saying build the bomb build the bomb build the bomb most of the research took place in los alamos research lab which was in new mexico and it was like they had these signs up around the lab like don't talk about this like they basically hired artists to like hide it the original banksy was in los alamos like they just had these artists come in and try to hide what the hell they were doing because they were building the nuke the los alamos research lab in new mexico which is where they were building the nuke Actually, 40 years later, Bob Lazar, famed alien research guy that claims that 100% he was able to work on alien spacecraft, worked at this exact place. So a little kawinky dinky that as soon as a nuclear bomb happens, that all of a sudden people start seeing aliens. And then 40 years later, Bob Lazar, one of the whistleblowers of alien technology, works there. Weird. Physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer was the director of of the Manhattan Project, and he a lot, of, and that's what he was, just the director. He gets credited a lot with being the father of the atomic bomb. He was not the father. He just appeared to be the father, like the relationship I have with my daughter. I'm not really their father, but I just appear to be. DNA test. So Oppenheimer was a, was a, was one of many men researching atomic bombs and what they can do. And the UK was actually ahead of the US on this research. A lot of people, the US was led to believe that Germany was neck and neck with them, but they weren't. They were throwing bullshit. 
It was BS rockets. It's kind of like how Russia, how we thought all oh, Russia was this big, bad country. And now they're, they're getting literally beaten with baseball bats by Ukraine. And, the, you know, the president's falling down the stairs, shitting his pants. It's like a whole thing. This is what happened with this. We thought Germany had all this power. And it's like, no, stupid. Where the U.S., the U.K. was number one, U.S. was number two, but then it's going to flip. U.S., we're going to beat them because we're going to steal some of those German scientists. So uranium was the key to this. Uranium was the part of the weapon that that made all the difference. It was actually Italian scientists, Fermil and Leo Salazar. They focused on uranium enrichment and nuclear chain reactions, and this was a big, big thing. Italy also fighting with the Axis powers, but we had their scientists working for us. Okay, so now it's 1943, the war's going on, the U.S. is fighting in Germany, they're fighting in Japan, it's like this dual-pronged war, Russia is fighting mostly Germany, and they're beating the shit out of Germany, by this point they're coming close to it, they're beating them back, because Hitler wanted to go all across Russia in the dead of winter and try to take over Russia, which is stupid. So all the big leaders, Stalin, FDR, Churchill, they meet in Tehran, Iran, in 1943 to discuss how we're going to win World War II. What's the strategy? Because Stalin was going to liberate Eastern Europe. FDR and Churchill were going to liberate Western Europe. And all was going to be happy. Stalin actually agreed to declare war on Japan after the Allied victory over Germany. And that's important because this ties into why we dropped the nuke. By the way, the nuke didn't just happen overnight. For years, they were trying to build this. They were trying to get the raw materials. They were trying to test the uranium, all these things. And the bomb actually cost $2 billion dollars at that time, which is 25 billion today. That's a lot of Yeezys. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens in history is something big has to happen. Something sets off a chain reaction and then things start to get going. So what happened was on April 12th, 1945, FDR died in the middle of the war. The nation was shocked. I'm like, why were they shocked? He had polio in the 40s. You're going to die, dude. You're in World War II, the Super Bowl of wars, and then your quarterback, the president, dies. It'd be like if Tom Brady just dropped dead in the middle of the playoffs. That's what it's similar to. But I feel like even if Tom Brady dropped dead, he would still throw a touchdown pass. I love you, Tom, but you need to retire. So what happens when a president dies? Well, the vice president has to take over. Veep, Julia Louis-Dreyfus dropped the nuke. JK. It was Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman, aka Harry S. Truman, becomes president April 12, 1945, right as FDR dies. Now, here's the thing with Harry Truman. Here's why this is important because FDR, for the most part, was probably scholars say not going to drop the nuke. He understood what it was going to do to the people. He understood now you're opening up Pandora's box. But Harry Truman. He was short. His mother used to say he looked like a woman. He was a very insecure man. He had something to prove. So perfect timing, Harry Truman comes in and he's like, how do I prove that I'm not a woman, mom, that I am taller than you think I am and I'm not some little bitch boy? I drop a nuke. So July 16th, 1945 in a desert in Almergordo, New Mexico, the first atomic bomb named the Gadget was dropped. It was successfully detonated. It was called the Trinity Test because it was named after some gay poet. And it created an enormous mushroom cloud 40,000 feet high. That's higher than Snoop Dogg, Homeless Pimp, anybody. Nobody gets that high. Only the A-bomb. And it was met with some interesting, weird reactions because Robin Oppenheimer, the director of the Manhattan Project, not the father of the atomic bomb, he said, we knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent because you knew now you just took the energy of the sun and unleashed it on earth. Uh-oh, spaghetti -o. So all around this time, the war really has changed. The Western powers are beating out Germany. Hitler's already committed suicide. Japan knows that they're most likely going to lose, but they have so much pride they're going to continue to fight. They will not give up. So you kind of have this perfect storm of Japan losing, Germany losing, Harry Truman needing a knockout blow, something to prove, and things are going to get bad. So in May 7th, 1945 is known as VE Day, Victory Europe Day, because Germany officially surrendered to the Western powers, the allies. It's not victory World War II victory yet because we're still fighting in Asia, but VE Day, 
May 7th, 1945. So the Potsdam Conference happens on July 26th, 1945 in Potsdam, Germany. The leaders, President Truman, we got all new leaders now. President Truman, Chinese President Chiang Kai-shek, and new British Prime Minister Clement Attlee because Winston Churchill had not been re-elected Prime Minister. Very weird. It's almost like maybe you it got discovered that you were the one who really bombed Pearl Harbor. I'm just kidding, but leave a comment and think. tell me if you think I'm right. So what these leaders issued was the Potsdam Proclamation to Japan asking the country to surrender. They basically said, we're going to give you a chance here, Japan, form a new democratic and peaceful government or face prompt and utter annihilation. So they chose the second one. So here's the thing. Japan was most likely going to surrender with or without a nuclear bomb. What you've probably heard many times is that the reason why Harry Truman had to drop the nuclear bomb was because the only other way to get Japan to surrender, because they just wouldn't surrender, was to invade Tokyo, their capital, and then we were going to suffer another potential million men dying, right? That's what Harry Truman said. But the reality of the situation is probably not because Japan was going to surrender, not because the U.S. was focused on them, not that they were scared of nuclear bombs and scared of the U.S., it's that Russia had stayed true to their promise and they were now going to start to invade Japan from the other side and Japan did not want to face Russia. They were more scared of Russia than the U.S. The Japanese, as soon as Russia declared war, Japanese was... They were about to be like, okay, we're sorry, we fucked up, we'll be a new peaceful democratic government, we'll play baseball, we'll do, we'll, we'll think, we got anime, we'll do all, we'll be Japanese, we'll sit down on the floor, we're, we're Japanese. It was Russia that scared them, not the US. Harry Truman, here's the truth, Harry Truman, Harry S. Truman, was not going to allow Japan to get away with anything. He was going to drop that nuclear bomb on innocent people one way or another, you just have to give him some excuse. He was not, he needed Harry Truman, in his little short man mind, needed to drop that nuclear bomb to show U.S. dominance over the world because he knew that even though Russia was on our side, they really weren't on our side. And he knew that there was going to be all these types of races to atomic bombs, to war machines, to the moon eventually. He was like, we got to show Russia where number one, the only way to do that, through the atomic bomb. A lot of people think, how did they pick Hiroshima? The reason why the United States picked Hiroshima to drop the first atomic bomb is because it didn't have any prisoners of war. Every other part of Japan, a lot of other parts of Japan had U.S. prisoners of war, not Hiroshima. They had no known American POWs, and it was an ideal target given its size. So unfortunately, Hiroshima was in the crosshairs for many reasons, and a lot of innocent people were going to die, and that sucks. August 6, 1945, a B-29 plane. Oh, I got to take my B-12 vitamin. A B-29 plane named the Enola Gay. No, my dad didn't name it. Dropped Little Boy. The first atomic bomb was called Little Boy at 8.15 on Hiroshima. Uranium bomb weighed 9,700 pounds. All I can say is you should have been intermittent fasting. It exploded 600 feet above the ground. At the point of explosion, the temperature in the air was around 1 million degrees Celsius. Yikes. The mushroom cloud went up 10,000 feet in the air. 80,000 people died instantly. Tens of thousands more over the coming weeks, months, and years from radiation exposure. But 80,000 died instantly. So for me, I don't care what the Japanese did to Nanking. The innocent people in that country didn't deserve to die that way. And I think Harry S. Truman, even though you're the president and you bleed red, white, and blue and you're American, I'm going to say you're a fuck boy. So it's horrible. 80,000 people get killed. It's sad. It sucks. So, and we just unleash the energy of the sun onto the human race. It's going to cause a lot of problems, but it gets even worse because Hiroshima wasn't the only one. Nagasaki comes next. Japan refused to surrender after the first nuke. They still wouldn't surrender because I think they probably just felt like, well, they're not going to nuke us again. We're not going to surrender. You know, we have a lot of pride. We're still not going to surrender. We're still not going to surrender. They were still just holding that pride. And then three days later on August 9th, 1945, the U.S. dropped what many people consider even more unnecessary than the first one. They dropped a second one on Nagasaki. And that one for sure, for sure, was just to show Russia that we are powerful and you should fear the United States because it made Russia and the world think, how many bombs do these motherfuckers have? But the truth is we only had two and we dropped them both. This one was called the Fat Man Bomb. 
and it was dropped over Nagasaki, site of a torpedo building plant, and it destroyed more than three square miles of the city. 40,000 people died instantly. So you have 120,000 people total, killed instantly, just nuked, evaporated, hor horrible. Still to this day, uh, you find effects of radiation in those parts of Japan. So, sucks. Sorry, Japan. Sometimes with history, fate intervenes, weather intervenes. Actually, Nagasaki, unfortunately, was not the intended target. It was their second choice. The first choice was Kokura, but they couldn't find it. U.S. bombers couldn't find it because it was a very cloudy day. So Kokura got saved and Nagasaki got hit. We found a survivor story from Hiroshima and this person said, my arms were badly burned. There seemed to be something dripping from my fingertips. I saw a schoolgirl with her eye hanging out of its socket. People looked like ghosts, bleeding and trying to walk before collapsing. I looked down and saw a man clutching a hole in his stomach trying to stop his organs from spilling out. The smell of burning flesh was overpowering. That's from a Hiroshima survivor. Um, they actually gave us his real name, but I don't know how to say it in Japanese. And did you know that the U.S. allies would actually drop leaflets over Japan basically saying, evacuate, you're going to get bombed, you don't want to be here, tell your government to stop the war. They were trying to warn them. I don't know if they dropped leaflets the day of the atomic bomb. I don't think it would have mattered, but... At least they tried. So on August 15th, 1945, Emperor Hirohito finally does a broadcast radio announcement to his people and surrenders. It was formally signed on September 2nd, 1945 on the deck of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. But finally, they surrendered after that second nuke and World War II officially comes to an end. Thank God. So... Harry S. Truman said that he had to drop two bombs that actually the dropping of the bomb saved Japanese lives because it would have gotten way worse. Who knows? You can comment below and tell us what you think. It's a very politically charged subject. Some people agree. Some people don't agree. But listen, the atom bomb and uh, the nuclear fission that we discovered because of this race to win World War II, it's not all bad. We discovered MRIs from it. You know, all these scientists now have all this energy producing stuff. We have v Tesla. I mean, Elon Musk put it inside of Tesla. So it is, there is good, but ultimately, you know, the truth of the situation to me is, is that we didn't have to drop these nukes. Japan was going to surrender anyway. We dropped them. Thank God nobody's dropped one since, but Russia, Ukraine, I'm looking at you. You might throw one at us. And if that happens, I here's what I think. Here's what I think. I think you guys, what you can take from this video is that if we do get nuked again, because I know it feels like we're on the precipice of World War III, my plan is just to go to Nagasaki because you're not going to nuke a place twice. So I think ultimately not everything is good, not everything's bad. But what I want you to do is leave a comment Tell me, what do you think about the atomic bomb? Did we need it? Did we not need it? Is Japan going to hit us back? What's going to happen with Russia, Ukraine? Am I gay? All right, thank you for watching this video. This is the new history channel, the Christery channel. As always, never forget, history is written by the winners, and we're winning Tiger Blood. <laughs>